Good morning. This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. And today we're talking about SRDs. And that means? System reference document. A while ago, ways ago, the OGL came out for Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition. And that is? OGL means Open Gaming License. And what happens is, is that I think it led to this boom in D20, right? And there was a boom in D20 that was kind of like, there was good D20 stuff and bad D20 stuff. Along those lines is the SRD, which is just the rules of the game, the rules, and that's it. And so uh, uh, online, you can find the SRD of D&D 3rd Edition and then 4th Edition and 5th Edition and also Pathfinder. I always thought that there were certain other companies lately that have their systems were so, to me, were really good and very, for different reasons. There were, sometimes they were simple. Sometimes they were just really neat. And I, they, they would come out with games, and every game would have that system, but it was a little bit different in each game, right? For example, Modifius came out with uh, the 2D20 system, I think was first come, it came out in Conan. They came out with various other role-playing games that they published, and they all had a version of this 2D20 system. Free League had their Mutant Year Zero RPG, and from that they used that system in other games like Coriolis, or versions of that system in Coriolis and Tales from the Loop and so on. And even to the the latest version was in Twilight 2000. Very heavily modified, but still the same system. Same thing with uh, Monty Cook Games. They came out with Numenera years ago I think it was like 10 years ago now and uh, they use that same system for various different games so in all this time that they've been publishing and making games making some really neat games in my opinion and opinion of a lot of other people there was no SRD there was no standard reference document was, and it's, the rules are just just that it's just the basic rules of the game how do you play what's the the system but this summer, all three of those companies are putting out SRDs. And some of them, I mean, and literally just last month in July, Monty Cook Games put it on their website. You could download it. Free League has done it. And uh, Modifius has just published their own also. Along with this SRD, they're also saying it's kind of like a, uh, what is it? Uh, kind of like an open gaming license. I don't know what, I forget what, exactly what they call it. But they're saying you can create your own content using our SRD and just go wild with it. And there's different versions of uh, what go wild means, right? Some of them say, you know, you can go ahead and use it f uh, in your, in your games, use it for your personal, for your personal games that you play on, play at home. Others like free league say, you know what, we're going to help you create content. And we're, even, you know, they have templates, I think you could download the templates from Drive Through RPG. I think they're working closely with Drive Through RPG, and they're saying you can even sell your stuff on Drive Through RPG. And we're not going to take a penny. We're not going to take a cut. Let uh, Drive Through RPG take their cut, but everything else is yours. Anything you create, you can put on the on Drive Through RPG using their templates. And the templates just help you get the formatting right to make it look neat uh, instead of a. Uh, what is it? And instead of like just a document, they have margins already set up, places to put art if you want to use art and stuff like that. So I think that's pretty neat. I think it's a, a very interesting way of doing business. And thinking about this, I'm thinking, you know, why would any of these companies, Free League, Modifius, mm -hmm. and Monty Cook Games, you're forgetting there are, there are other companies. Oh yeah, yeah. Fate. Yeah, Fate has Fate. the SDR. Yes. I, those are the top three that just came to mind right at the top of my head. And there are also, those are the ones that the companies are doing. Right. There's one for Gumshoe also. and um, But then there's one like, there's one like travel for Traveler, oh, which yes. is a totally just gamer one so that people can discuss the rules. It's not official or anything. Okay. It's just the... To wrangle, to figure out what the rules are. Right, right. So the f the weird thing is that, indeed, you cannot copyright a mechanical system. Can't do it for whatever reason. It's much like a, like even a board game. Like the game, you cannot copyright the system of the game. You can copyright the pictures like Monopoly. You can 
Park Place and all this other stuff, you, you can copyright that. But the fact that if you roll, what, two six-sided dice to move your pawn around this board, there's no copyright on that. And you, you can't copyright rules and uh, systems. So you could, you know, do it yourself. And some and s- some of that has happened with the 2D6 system, right? Which is the original Traveler system. And there's all kinds of games that use it. The system is still the same. It's roll 2D6, and you have to roll over a certain target number. And if you go on drive through RPG, you type in 2D6 system, and it'll pop up tens, if not hundreds, of different games. But here you have the publisher actually offering the SRD to kind of make it a like united front of games that can come out using that system. I don't know about your united front analogy. No, but... I don't know about united front, but all the games are going to be, if you follow the SRD, all the games under that SRD license or enter this SRD logo will be, the, the system itself will be the same. So you don't have to learn a different system every time you play one of these games. I think it was pretty neat. So I forgot about Fate. And of course, there's a lot of other games. There's like Apocalypse World which people have hacked the crap out of it, that one and changed it and modified it. And, and you know, there's all kinds of terms that people use, with, especially with that game. And it has been very successful. A lot of games have been very successful using Apocalypse World mechanic, which is what 2D6 and you try to roll over a 7 or something. You can uh, succeed with a complication and stuff like that. So I think it's very neat. Uh, the, the SRD... I'm not sure that Fate has come out with an actual rule book or rules or um, or what do you call it? Like a PDF of, of what uh, that The is. Fate S- SRD publishes the entirety of the Fate Core and Accelerated plus the system toolkit as an accessory to them. Those games are both completely free and released under Creative Commons and the OGL. Creative Commons, that's, an- that's another term or, or something that's propped up saying that if you you can use our product and and share it and modify it and there's different types of creative commons licenses and they're all there's like one two three and four and they all have different variations of legally what you can do with their with that license like some people like creative commons one lets you do anything you want you can change it you can hack it whatever you want to call it and they say you don't even need to give attribution to to the original owner except maybe make it not make it but say that got this from creative commons license number one two and three it gets a little bit more restrictive like if you modify it you have to say that you modified it or you have to put in that you have that creative commons license and that this is the person that you originally created it just like what they call it i don't know what the name of it is but like give the name of the person who created it like recognition of, of where you got some of this stuff at and as the number gets higher it becomes more and more restrictive and sometimes they say well you can't use this for creative purposes that's creative commons license i think that's that stems out of the the whole idea of the ogl the open gaming license but they use it for music they use it for all kinds of other artistic endeavors and to your question, it says that Evil Hat gets a large portion of income from the from Fate being implemented in other games, so they must they must um, have people give them money for, or they must get money from what people do that right. with the S. Right, right. So a lot of times that's what happens. A lot of times that's what happens. Uh, Free League has decided that if you use their SRD and even if if you use their templates and all that. You can create something, sell it on Drive Through RPG, and they won't take a cut of it. Drive Through will charge you whatever they normally charge, but they're not going to make a dime off your creation. Where you're right, other SRDs they say, well, if you use our SRD, you have to have this logo on it, and you have to give us I don't know one percent, ten percent, whatever their number is. I'm not sure how Monty Cook Games or Modifius is is doing with their SRD, but. Uh, Free League has taken a really like just create as much stuff as you can and we'll even help you and you can even try to make money off of it cut out of it so, which I think is pretty strange at the at the time I was thinking why would any company come out with SRD right well because it gives the people that play their games a, a creative opportunity to 
do stuff for their own games, right? I mean, to to use what they like. And people do homebrews all the time. That's true. This is just a, a more formalized kind of homebrew. Well, you're right. I think some people think, well, they're going to do this anyway. And in in reality, I I did I did that. I've done it a few years ago. I guess it was nine, 19... It was before the pandemic. Was it wasn't 19. <laughs> We'll take a decade off. In 2020 was before the pandemic. I was hoping to run a game at a convention that ran, a uh, Kublicon, that ran in uh, May. M- May and Memorial Day weekend, the end of May. So I was working on this game, and had, we had just recently watched this show called Carnival Roll. And I really liked it. I thought it was neat, and I thought it was like, wow, pretty cool. And sometime during that time that show came on, Multi Cook Games put out a free version of their of Carnival Road, the RPG, and it was like 60, 70 pages, and it was it was like a, a PDF anyway. It was a super nice looking PDF. It had nice art. It wasn't just text uh, document, right? It was an actual something that they could have published and stuff like that. It was free, and they published it, and it had all kinds of backgrounds on the on the whole setting of Carnival Road. And I thought it was pretty neat. I really liked it. Except I wasn't sure. I wanted, when I run games at cons, I wanted anybody to come and play. So I always say beginners welcome. Now, I'm not saying that Monty Cook's uh, cipher system is difficult to learn or hard to do. But I wanted a game that people could make characters at the table and wouldn't take that much time. Wouldn't take hours. It would take like maybe 15 minutes. And you could play. That was playable. So I decided to, well, you know what? I really like years, not mutant years zero, but the year zero system, which I saw in Coriolis and especially when I saw in Tales of the Loop. And I really like Tales of the Loop. And I had previously run Tales from the Loop at a con. And like I said, it was the only time I've ever done it where people were able to make characters at the table. And we then went to go play. We started playing. So I decided to make a year zero version of you decided to homebrew it homebrew it carnival roll and what i did and i did i used google and i did all these things and i made it google uh was the sheet or google or page or whatever and i was i wrote i wrote it out i wrote out the rules i came up with my own uh you know different things like uh i forget what they call them but they're like feats in the or advantages or special abilities you basically took a bunch of different games and mushed them together the way you wanted it well, the main game was the rules. The main was the setting of and the and the ideas in Monty Cook's uh, free yeah, RPG, yeah, yeah. and the other was the system of of Mutant Year Zero, which then became called Year Zero System. And because I had run Coriolis, Mutant Year Zero, Tales from the Loop, I I got, and Aliens and stuff. Like that, I got the idea of like, oh, okay, this this is really neat. I like the way this this system works, and I just, it, it took me less than a week. I put it together. I threw some art in there and I made it. Didn't you ask Felipe to help you a little bit? Uh, I asked Bay to edit it for me. So he did, actually. Didn't you ask Felipe for some help on? Oh, yeah, yeah. I asked people to look at it to see if there's any mistakes I made. Yeah, and, I remember you doing that. And, and I did. I did. Bay and Felipe, and they both said, oh, you mis- misspelled this one wrong or this doesn't make sense, which, you know, was weird because Google. That has that auto, not the autocorrect, but it tells you if it's the wrong word or something. But sometimes it was the right, not the wrong word. It only that it's it's a computer saw. If you're sometimes if the word is real, it will leave it there. And that's what was happening, right? I was using your instead of your you are right, and so they, it would correct that stuff. But other times it was the right type of word, just in the wrong part of the sentence. It happens to me all the time. I write form instead of from. <laughs> yes, yes, those kind of mistakes it doesn't catch. So that's anyway, why, so that's why you have then, to do proofreading. And I asked them about, I asked them both about, what do you think about this special ability? Is it too powerful compared to what other people can do? Right? If you never watched Carnival Row, it's a steampunk fantasy type of uh, setting where and it doesn't take place on Earth; it has its own uh, world, but where humans are are obviously uh, in control, and all these fae folk have uh, are basically become second class citizens in this particular show and then in the rules it was pretty neat so anyway i decided to do that i did it i think i made i made the rules and 
how to make a character in like 16 or 17 pages. And my hope was to print these out and just give them to the players and say, you can make a character and we can make them right here, which, you know, 15 pages or 16 pages. And I had art in it, right? It was really easy. I thought it was really cool. Anyway. Anyway, it did not come to pass because I was planning this in 2020. And and when May shows up, I think March, we went into lockdown. And like a lot of people, we were thinking, ah, four w- weeks, we'll see you in a month. And that, of That's course, not true. Happened. We didn't think that. I thought that. I thought that. I didn't think that. <laughs> you didn't think that? No. Wow. Well, you, then you are rarity in the world. Well, then you are. Some will say pessimistic. Like I said, when I made that version of my own version of, of uh, Carnival Row, I used Year Zero. But I didn't have any help as far as like how to make, how to balance all this stuff out. And what the SRD does, it gives you this nice, good set of rules. It's, you know, I, want to, I don't know if you say rock solid, but this solid set of rules that you can use and drop any, any system or any uh, setting that you want. And, and Monty Cook does the same thing, and so does uh, Modifius. And they're all variations of, of complexity, right? I think the, the most crunchy system of the bunch is probably Modifius 2D20 system. And then comes Monty Cook, and then comes Year Zero. And Monty Cook system isn't really the, that difficult. The only reason I didn't like the idea of Monty Cook the, they call it the cipher system is this idea of these throwaway uh, ciphers which are one turn time use things that you could just use and then discard and you can find other ones and I and other than in Numenera which is this which which the whole system comes from which takes place billions of years in Earth's future imagine that and uh, Earth has had seven I think seven uh, what do you call it epics uh, ep- uh, eras of uh, a human existence, the groups of people have come into power, they're in power, and then they fall. And it, and that's done seven times. And it's called an epic. Epic? Epic. Epic, okay. And then... E-P-O-C-H. You, and then you... Epoch. Yes. Okay. And then your players play characters in that kind of world where there's all kinds of uh, these amazing things, creations that have lasted millennia of, of years of thousands and thousands of years and the current people are basically living in this world of like they don't even know what these things are for or how they were created so it's kind of like and not, not post-apocalyptic but it's post seven civilizations and so they, they don't really know what stuff is so the idea of ciphers is that you find these little things that have these weird you figure out it can do one thing and you choose when to use it and then it, it then it just it runs out the battery runs out it disintegrates or whatever which i i think is neat i think that that's kind of like in gamma world where things just have like one use or one cell or whatever and then it doesn't work and since you can't make it and, and you can't unless you know how to find another power cell or whatever. But in this case, you don't even know, you don't even know what that is, or you don't even know how, how that would work. So in, in that kind of setting, this far future, you are living in the remnants and the previous civilizations, ciphers make sense. But in a modern espionage system, I don't see how, unless you're really doing with gadgets like 007, but still, it's not very, uh, I don't, I don't I'm not sure how how well the cipher system translates to other settings. Maybe anyway. they've changed it for other settings. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think there's ways you can change it and make it more sense. It's just at the time when I'm was thinking about it, this is 2 years ago, I was like, "Uh, eh, I just think that Mutant Zero is one easier to make a character in and uh, at the table. I think it's easier to make a character at the table and then the other part is it's just quicker, I think. Like I said, I, I, I made, we made uh, characters in less than 15 minutes and we played, were playing and it was a lot of fun. I mean, I think people really enjoyed making the character and because it was so easy and quick, it wasn't like it didn't drag down the game at all. That's my experience with, do, with uh, homebrewing or I don't know what you want to call it, the porting the system to a, a setting that I liked. Even even though it was already made for another system. So what the SRD does is that if you have a setting 
that you've been playing in for a long time or been thinking about. And it's always tough to, I think, to make a, a what is it, a system to run a role playing game. I think it's probably one of the more difficult things that you can do as a person who wants to make an RPG and having an SRD that will work with your system and then you can just plug in. I think this is a, a easy sell for somebody like that who's working on something, uh, a homebrew setting, and they want a a system that they can just plug in. And all of these you can just really plug in, you know, and and you can make any kind of a uh, it'll fit almost any genre, any setting. I think that's pretty neat. I really, I really think that's well. well the the gaming people publishers have done this already because they they've taken Pathfinder and put it into Savage Worlds, right? Or was it a com- as a combination? Oh yeah, that was that was an interesting thing that happened. I uh, I don't know. I'm just saying because some people like the system, the Sa- right. the Savage World system, right? And they 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 did that. I, that's one of the ones that I've seen. And that that was interesting because that that was a uh, that was Paizo Paizo. How do you say the company? Paizo? And was the uh, oh my god, I, I had it right at the tip of my tongue. The game company that makes uh, Savage Worlds, uh, Pinnacle, they basically made a Kickstarter, joined force, made a Kickstarter, and deci- and worked. Goddamn loud cars, and worked on uh, making this together. And I think one of the things was is that Savage World didn't have an inherent fantasy system. They had never come out with one. Pinnacle had never come out with one. And Pathfinder, for whatever reason, wanted to get into that market. Like there was a lot of to people- expand. Well, yeah, who would want, who wouldn't want to? So they see, uh, what is it? They see Savage Worlds doesn't have a, a, a built in fantasy, uh, world or rule set or whatever. And they see that as a, a place that they can sell stuff to that group of people, right? Here is Pathfinder. This has a full fleshed out world. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, and I know this is true because I've heard people <laughs> talk about it. That people who really liked Pathfinder, but all of their people play Savage Worlds right. and like that system, which is, what is it? the Is it the Savage Worlds system or yeah, Pinnacle Savage system? Worlds. Savage Worlds. So they, they play in that system. And I know people have ported Pathfinder to that system because I heard people talk about it at wow. a convention yeah. that all of my people like this system, but I really like this game. So right. we've just adjusted it to play it this way. Well, there you go. And they did that before... Before they did this, they officially published it. Yeah. Yeah. So that that was a big company, well, big company in RPG world. Uh, Paizo were hooking up with uh, Pinnacle, and they decided to have uh, a working relationship, and so they published that. And I think they kickstarted it, so obviously made a ton of money and published it. A lot of people, there's a lot of naysayers out there anyway. They're going, well, why, 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 why? You know what? I think the, the kickstarter speaks for itself. I think I think that's true because I can understand there people are always we just talked to somebody recently on an interview right. and he was saying that anytime you put yourself out there people are going to say the worst things to you. <laughs> yes, yes. But I think that people that really like a certain system and want to play with that system but they want to play in a fantasy setting and you don't have that, which I find interesting because Savage Worlds is the one where you can have dinosaurs and cowboys. Oh, you can have anything you want. So, so I think that kind of is a fantasy setting. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> well, Savage World doesn't have a setting, right? Right. It's just a set of rules. And they say, well, it's kind of like GURPS. So they say, well, if you, if you want a, a fantasy setting, you, and they give you examples right, of an right. elf and an orc and all that stuff. But as far as that, it's like, it's, like uh, it's up to the GM to say, okay, yeah, there's no computer science in this because it's a fantasy game. Right. Like that skill or whatever. That's like when you're, when you're trying to do a GURPS character yes. and there's like all these things and you're like, wait, I don't think that goes with this. I don't know if you were around when I was making a character for Mike's GURPS. I believe game. I was. And the GURPS book has all, is huge, right? Well, there's three of them. But the character b- book is pretty big and it's pretty small type. And there's a lot of rules in it, right? And then you got to figure out, and then Mike, and then you, and it's a it's a buy a point right. buy system, point right? Buy. So so you have to figure out what you want to buy with your points, right? And I'm like, going, I don't think that goes with that, with right. what you're doing, right? So there's like like computer science, right? Yeah. Or hacking. Those are skills that are library science. Those are skills that are in the GURPS book. And here we are making. I'm making a medieval character. So I'm like, well, obviously, 
So I'm not going to use that one. That, uh, but that doesn't mean that someone wouldn't unless the GM specifically said these are off limits, right? Right, right. And so that's what you have to do in Savage Worlds and GURPS. You say, these, these, this, this, and this is off the table because it doesn't exist because of this setting. Right. Right. So, so creating the, so when Pathfinder or Piezo and and Pinnacle get together and create Pathfinder in Savage Worlds. Right. And on the cover of the book, I saw it at Barnes & Noble, yeah. it says Pathfinder, and then it has the Savage Worlds thing. And that just, like, it kind of freaked me out for a minute because yeah, I'm all, they, they, they put, it's like mind, you know, mind bending. How did this happen? And then I'm all, I had read about it, though, so I knew how it happened. But still seeing it was kind of interesting. And I was yeah. like, that's very interesting. And I can totally understand why, the SRD thing works because people like to take the system that they like. Yes. Like Saul, and he he just went on a whole rant, rant about it, but he loves the year zero system. Yeah. That's Free League, right? Right. I think it's cool. I, I totally understand. I played in these games with him. So, like, I really like the Alien because it's one of my favorite genres and... The idea that you get these panic point or panic dice, stress, uh, right? Stress, stress. Dice. Uh, stress. Yes. Are you sure? Yeah, stress, and then and then if you if you botch or if you roll a a one on the stress, then you dice, panic. Then there's a chance you well, there's a chance you might panic. You roll on a panic yeah. table. That mechanic is not in other game systems, right? It's not in Tales of the Loop. It's not in Coriolis and stuff like that. But you have different things in, in Tales of the Loop when you you get to add. They don't call them stress die. But you get to add die, but you lose certain, or you or you lose certain things. Like you get tired right. and you want to go home. Right. Different things like that, yes. which is the same kind of is the same kind of of idea. Different different implementation. implementation. Yes. Yeah. And I and I was gonna say about about uh, Pathfinder, Savage Worlds Pathfinder is that it got a, you know a lot of Savage Worlds. I guess I don't know who people were complaining that. Well, that's ridiculous. But. If you want to play in Savage World, use Savage Worlds and be in a fantasy system, then you have, like I said, you have to do as a GM, you have to, okay, this is not allowed, this is not allowed. And then if there's certain types of monsters or character classes and stuff like that, not classes, but uh, archetypes or let's say dwarf, what pluses and minuses do you get for being a dwarf and an elf or a, or a half ogre, ogre or whatever rules, you know, whatever you can imagine, you got to come up with that stuff. And if you could just buy it, like it, it makes it easier. You know, I was gonna buy Pathfinder, and 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 it's in Savage Worlds lingo, so I totally understand it. I'm a Savage World guru. Everything makes sense. It doesn't take rocket surgery to figure out that. Especially if you have people who have played Pathfinder or like Pathfinder, and they've been asking you to run the game, and you're like, going, I don't want to learn all those rules." Yes. Which, by the way. Is a lot for Path Pathfinder yes. is very crunchy. Yes. So I mean, it's a great system. I like it because only because the boys are like telling me how great it is all the right. time. And, and it's true, you're right. <clears throat> and I think it's a good system, but it tends to be very crunchy. Where Savage Worlds is a lot easier to to digest. And every group of role players is different. Right. Some role players love the crunchiness, and yes. some role players love the crunchiness, or they. And at the same time, they like more role playing and less crunchiness, and so they'll they'll morph their games into whatever it is they want. Right, right. You're totally right, and I think that's what it's about. That is why SRDs are uh, are very useful for people. It, it comes, you know, it's just the rules. You can figure out uh, what you want to use and don't use, and you can make it fit your world, your setting, your genre that you that you are thinking of. Well, and I think the other big big draw is that especially since everything there's drive through rpg and and you can put out pdfs right or right i think the big draw is that then for the creative person they have this great idea and their friends love it so they want to they want to share it with the world yeah yeah and that's what i think that's what it is you want to share what you think is the best with with other people especially gamers so that they can look at it and go oh i like this or or i'll use it or i don't and if it's part of a system that you already like or a rule set that you already like oh i've been wanting to go with that genre but i haven't seen it before maybe i'll pick this one up right and in a certain sense a lot of People are doing this with uh, D and D Fifth Edition because it's so popular, right? Yeah, because it's it's like, it's popular. like when they had the open gaming yeah. license yeah. before. Was that 
D and D two. Yeah. Okay. D and D third edition. Yeah. That's the open game license started. Because that was I forget who was the person who said that. I I don't know if it was Ryan Dancy or it was Monty Cook, but one of those two guys I'm pretty sure was that they were at the big meeting and they go, "How about if we just give it away?" And they're like, I "Like all the executives looked at them going, <laughs> are you freaking crazy? What are you talking about?" Because D and D and TSR and all those older companies were very tight fisted. Uh, they wanted to. Oh, no, yeah. you can't do that. You can't use our name, and that was the only set of rules you can find over that genre. And you had to come, and some company, you know, you had to wait till some company came up or create your own rules, which is very hard. To have the, a genre like, let's say, you wanted to play uh, space something or other. I only say it's very hard to create your own rule system because. The, some of the guys that I play with, they like to take the rule system and break it down and, and say, tear it apart and say, this is why this works. This is why this doesn't work. And they literally take the time, which is beyond me, to read every <laughs> single nuance of all of these rules and tell me what is said and what it actually means. You got to remember that the two of these people were talking about are retired, so... <laughs> they might have a little bit more time around it. Well, yeah. They're really good. And it, it's it's made me look at rule sets and go, okay, I can see when someone says this is broken, which the boys love that term because yes. they play all uh, the boys, uh, our, our sons and even our 50 year old, <laughs> 60 year old friends. <laughs> a, a, a famous guy is Chris, right? He oh, would always say about yes. certain spells in D&D. Oh, well, that's that's that spell's broken. Okay, it doesn't matter. And then, you know, it was just, I forget what spell it was that he, you know, he was adamantly saying, you should not allow this spell in this, in this D&D game. I go, Chris, just hold on to your short. It's not a big deal. But to him it was, because yeah. he's looking at it and going, this doesn't work. And as, as just the casual gamer, me, I'm like, okay, well, that's the rule. Now, how does the rule work? And they'll tell me. But now that I've been playing with, with some of these guys for a while, I, I listen to them when we play a new game, and Saul loves to bring new games out. So they're more than willing to, to read all the rules and figure out all the stuff. Right. And I'm sitting there going, oh, you literally took... I, a, a liminal was, was one of the ones that I, I really enjoyed when we yes, played it. And I loved it when Bay and Morgan were looking at the rules. And they took the rules, and they go, oh, I see why they did this. I see. So the werewolf is really, really powerful, but... These are the disadvantages, right? And these right. are the and and it like opened my eyes, going, "Wow, one, these people are really, really smart." Because and <laughs> which I already Attention knew. To detail. But the the fact that if they're doing this, obviously other gamers are doing this, and I know because right. you know gamers like to know what the rules are. They read the rules to figure out what they can and can't do in their role playing, right? Yes. And some of them are play fast and loose with the rules and some of them look at the rules and go oh no this is the way the rule is written and this is the way we're going to do it we discussed this before with uh doing uh when i was looking at flames of freedom uh, i forget what the name of the company is but uh they i decided to run this game because they gave because i kickstarted it and they gave me the pdf and they also had a quick start rule right <laughs> so i did the quick start rules but what i go man they, they have this like uh it's not an initiative but they have like this two two actions that you can do mm -hmm. right and i go i'm just gonna do one and you know do let do it like in D, &D you know everybody gets an action and bada be bada boom as well as you know laissez-faire attitude towards the rules really kind of irritated some of his players cause well they didn't like, know they were irritated till until they, they read the rules and they're like hey, you know you did it wrong oh like, yeah i didn't want to do it because everybody was basically learning how to play and blah, blah, blah. And someone goes hey i'll run it the way that it's supposed to be played was that morgan or bay <laughs> that was bay <laughs> I, and I didn't say it exactly like that, but oh, that's no, what he no, meant. It came across that way. <laughs> I'm gonna play. I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna play. Let's, with let's the play it with rules. the rules the way they the, the rules real. are. Thank you, babe. And see how it goes. You're my best friend, babe. <laughs> Which I okay. thought was hilarious. Yeah, I thought it was. Yeah, I was really. I was really laughing the whole time. Man. It was, so I was like going, "Oh man, oh I see. Oh, <laughs> I didn't take the time to actually read. I didn't like that rule, so I just changed <laughs> it right away." <laughs> Anyway, so that does happen, and I think everybody everybody who plays games, I always think, and this is my opinion, is that everybody who plays RPGs for a while has an idea, whether it's a setting, whether it's a rules or world or whatever you want to call it, because they tend to be creative people. And I think if they look at any of these SRDs from Fate to Cypher System, Year Zero, 
2D20, and there's more out there. Like if you look at OSR, you look at 2D20, 2D6 systems. Uh, I don't know if there's an SRD for that, but there's definitely. Well, you know, there's one for Traveler, right? And I think you will uh, find something that will work with whatever you're working, you're thinking of, and unless you're really tied to a system that that somehow is uh, only will work with the. Same you really like that system genre. and that genre. Right. I think you could take a look at these and find something that you like. And some companies actually have stuff to help. And you can literally sell it, which is pretty neat. And you're right, because people have the the house rules. Yes. And people have, you know, they, they, they'll sit down and they'll go, okay, we're, we're playing D&D. We don't use this character or we don't like this oh, they rule. Home- they homebrew it <laughs> and then uh, they homebrew their own worlds even, right? Oh, and yeah. they, they, they take the D&D system or the whatever, a, a D&D or whatever they like. And this is, this is the rules we're using because everybody knows that. And this is our setting. Right. And they just have done it for years. And now you actually can go online and some of them have gone, oh, I can do this. <laughs> you go, okay, cool. And you may even make a few shekels as if you... Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. But there you go. It is a chat. So there you go. This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. And you have a good day.